and welcome to this CodeBuddies.org live code hangout. Today we will be working on the Sustainable Urban Design app. Um, previously we've uh, di displayed some GeoJSON data from OpenStreetMap on a, uh, a slippy map that's coming through PostGIS and Django. Um, then we allowed the user to define a radius around points of interest and kind of buffered that radius and kind of merged those polygons where they overlapped. And the kind of idea here is to allow people to do kind of um, ad hoc livability analysis. We, we don't want to just call it spatial analysis because that's too abstract. Specifically, we want to facilitate people's thinking around sustainability and livability. Um, probably one of the best examples of an app in this vein uh, comes uh, through a YouTube video and uh, a little bit of searching around. I can't remember exactly how I found it, uh, but it's a demonstration of the Tur Turku open platform. It's Turku is a town in Finland. It's I think like one of the like the third largest uh, city in Finland. If you consider like Vanta and Helsinki is one city. Tampere I think is the second. Tur Turku is the third. Uh, oh snap! What was that? Hmm. Any case. Um, Let's see if it'll render real quick. <laughs> what it does is, I think behind the scenes, it's using this Geo Trellis library, and allows you to show for like a uh, walk, like different heat maps um, for what would, on a high level, be called you know livability uh, metrics. In essence, how active places are, how lively, you know, how many, what are the most popular outdoor places. And then you can define points of interest in a map, which is kind of exactly what we're doing, more or less. We're working with points of interest and finding places in um, a certain distance of those. And then it does network analysis, so routing, uses a routing engine uh, to find how far you can travel, what places are in available via the road and transport networks within a given that given distance. And then let me get all three of these on the map. You can tell this is happening on the server side, and maybe it's waiting for the response to the client. I'm not exactly sure of how the how this is architected, and uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to find a source code on GitHub or GitLab. Uh, but the author ha is in. Uh, where I'm in communication with the author through their YouTube video, and hopefully something will emerge uh, through that. But now this cool part is you can then um, compare each of these three points of interest on various uh, livability metrics, the diversity, and they each have a um, <coughs> kind of a definition here, the, mix, the mixture of urban amenities in this case. Uh, you know, this is <laughs> really close to uh, what we're trying to achieve with this sustainable urban design app uh, in terms of the output. And it's really, you know, elegant looking and informative. And essentially we just would like to allow people to define maybe well, essentially the radius, and uh, maybe choose some metrics. Not exactly sure how, how the projects would sort of converge, but I'm hoping we can learn something from how this is implemented. And I, I don't know, you know, how much, for example, how different uh, routing by street network is from just using, you know, more or less static buffers. I don't know how much or value that gives for the cost, the computational cost. So our code is here on GitHub. Uh, just This is not a uh, tutorial. This is a live code hangout and live code session. So I will be figuring things out as I go. And if you'd like the TLDR, I'm already four minutes in the video. I should have mentioned this earlier. But usually you can scroll to about 10 or 20 minutes before the end of the video. Look for the code, <laughs> code Buddies blue screen. And I'll do a summary. I'll show the blue screen and do a summary uh, in this session, so while things are fresh in my mind. All right, so we have the project open. I haven't got things running yet. I just merged pull request into master um, with our r most recent changes. Today I was going to I think work on this idea of a project.
and this is what I mean, we want to allow people to set their own goals and parameterize those. Uh, so similar to how this lets you set the distance, uh, maybe even choosing the um, livability metrics that are relevant to your kind of context or your city or your project scope. Some projects could be a neighborhood scope, some could be a district, um, some could be a whole city or even a regional or nationwide. Um, and there's just different complexity that comes into play. Uh, but I reckon, you know, depending on what kind of da data query you're getting back, you could have a, a really large scope, a national scope, and have just as many data points as some queries in a neighborhood could return. So what that amounts to is the more data you get back, the more difficult it is for it to work in the client, and you have to then shift over to doing things on the server side, like how these... Um, you know, the client can put the point of interest here and it waits for a response from the server with the street network uh, analysis, then it kind of animates that in stuff like that. You got a balance between client and server. We'd like this app to run in the um, browser. So again, this is not the code from our project. It is another project uh, being served by GitLab, but I don't know, uh, I've looked and I can't find this, this source code, unfortunately. So I think we'll just hop over to Wagtail and we'll define a new d component to our data model that's called a project. This session won't deal so much with the analysis and the visualization, um, but we'll come back to those. I'm also sim thinking something like the way you know users use Tableau, for example, you have mm, different folders and those folders are kind of different facets and, and reports that are relevant to a specific group of stakeholders or yeah, something like that. A project would be uh, on that scope. It's a group of stakeholders that are coming around a particular area of interest and bringing their expertise to that area of interest, um, whether or not they're you know, working with the master plan or if they're planning the uh, municipal water network or transport networks, or planners, things like that, all coming together on a common uh, canvas, but each looking through their own layer. So we'll activate our virtual environments. And we need to spin up the database. We need a branch. And it's kind of meta, but the project is, this is an open source project, software project, and we're going to define a data model for projects, for urban design projects. And those projects start with analysis. You've got to know what, what the situation is to kind of know what you want to change. So you look at what the, situ the situation is, identify issues, maybe set goals, and then seek designs uh, in, in kind of brainstorm or sort of I, you know, think divergently about how to solve the problem and converge on a particular solution. That's all the process that designers undergo. Um, we don't want to necessarily um, commandeer that project we, process. We want to support it, le letting them use other tools uh, that, as they, as the people, the planning pe uh, professionals see fit, uh, but kind of offer a platform for them to collaborate and you know, periodically put their uh, output, their design artifacts into a, uh, a common framework for discussion and feedback and integrated analysis. All right, so we've got our um, database running in the database tool, and then we're going to run. We're going to run Wagtail and Django. I just wish this terminal had a copy. URL because when I open that up, it opens in the default browser. All right, so here default Wagtail welcome page. But if we run over to this is the Django administration and CMS, there's the Wagtail admin. Let's see. Okay, yes. Mm, no, I just don't know what to do it. 
All right, so ooh, there's a Wagtail update. We'll do that another time. Uh, so Wagtail is a content management system built on top of Django. Let me just hop over and check its Twitch. Everything is set up and looking good over here. Oh, looks like we're... Well, the bit rate's pretty good. I guess it spiked. It was really high for a while there, but now we're still streaming decently. Um, it essentially gives you a really nice kind of WordPress-like admin interface for your data model that you define. Um, I don't know if this will be the interface the primary primary users will see. It could be. I think this app might have kind of two faces, two yeah interfaces. One is um, where you log in and define projects and other um, aspects, and then the other is this interactive JavaScript app app where you do the analysis and, and interactive uh, planning uh, with manipulating geometries and stuff like that and tweaking parameters, those would get persisted in the database that you could then um, uh, access through the Wagtail UI. They may converge, the primary user interface may be that design app, I don't know, this is a work in progress. But what we do here is, this platform folders are Django project, um, now we were using D C SQLite for a while, but we stopped using that, so I'm just going to move that to trash. We're now using Postgres because um, essentially we're using a lot of spatial data and we wanted to move that into PostGIS. It might be worth uh, experimenting uh, to see if we can get GeoDjango running. In particular, let me just double check. Because projects will have a, a spatial extent, which is basically a geometric field. I don't know if that's urgent that we define that. Uh, but I think GeoDjango is going to be useful for a couple of things. Field types. Yeah. Field types is fine. Um, for example, we can define our database schemas for the OpenStreetMap data as Django models, and then let and use those models, the ORM, um, uh, the classes that are defined for the ORM, to do advanced querying and, and perhaps even composing queries, whereas right now I'm doing everything with static, those types of queries with static SQL, and I'm not sure how composable SQL is, like I can't con easily dynamically construct a SQL statement like having multiple where conditions and things like that, it doesn't seem as straightforward as maybe popping together a dictionary, a Python dictionary, we can just append fields and things like that. So there's a Django model field, I'm going to type GeoDjango. All right, spatial field types, so you geometry. I guess, you know, an extent could be simply modeled with a, um, a polygon. The reason the extent is, I think, going to be important is it'll be used in bounding box queries to say only get us, you know, only ever get us data within this project scope, for example. That'll make our queries more performant, then we can drill down into different uh, amenities and things like that. We'll come back to this when we need it. I don't, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure we'll need GeoDjango, but let's go ahead and create this initial app for, you know, just projects, basically. So each of these folders is pretty much an app. And this OpenStreetMap app right now has like a static query that again I, is just um, well it's parameterized, but it and it's probably not securely parameterized. I think there we might be a little bit at a risk of SQL injection, but um, it's how we're fetching data from the OpenStreetMap database that we've cloned into PostGIS. Uh, whereas I could have some ORM models here, but in any case, we're going to find a new. Project here, an app, Django app. An app should name should be plural. And the model name should be singular. That's the pattern we're going to follow. So it scaffolds an initial application. We're going to have some linting errors because. We'll have unused imports in a lot of these files. Mm -hmm. 
So we're going to define a data model. And one of the first choices is, do I just use a plain Django data model, or do I uh, inherit from the Wagtail page model? Django models are just flexible. They don't assume anything about your data. You essentially just define a class with the fields you'd like and uh, indexes and stuff like that. But um, the Wagtail page model comes with a lot included, such as, um, uh, well, it's a hierarchical data model. So I guess could projects have sub-projects? That would be a natural. And do, uh, so Wagtail model is built around a content publishing paradigm. So you have like drafting states and authorship. Uh, I'll show you real quick. There we go. And then we'll just uh, hop over to the definition there. Um, F12. So page models are giving us quite a lot. They're inheriting from th these uh, models allow you to construct multiple related uh, entities with a single form. Um, they give you drafting states and URL slugs. Whether or not it's published. SEO, I mean, a whole bunch of stuff. Now, regular Django models can be uh, used to populate the Wagtail admin, so we don't have to use the Wagtail page model. I just don't remember how difficult it is to go from a Wagtail page model to a Django model or vice versa. I just don't think we'll need it. Because the, you know, the main goal of having a user interface for these Django models, you know, Wagtail can support that. Eventually, we might want role-based access control to these, uh, but now I don't think it's really that important. All right, let's keep it simple. We're just going to have a uh, regular Django model, model, and every project will have a title, I suppose, would be good. Which is a 
character field, max length 255. would like a description that's pretty good for now um, let's work on getting these two fields into the wagtail admin UI first alright so we've created string representation created a new model we essentially want to stop the server make a migration file that takes uh, we have to register our, um, our new app with the Project settings. <laughs> then it'll be able to find it. The model file we just defined and make a migration that says the database was in this state and we're going to make this change to it so it's like a delta of database structures we're going to actually apply that delta to our Postgres database so look through all the apps and apply the migration we just created Why is it not picking up? Yeah, there we go. So it's just a Python class that says how to modify the database, what operation to apply to the database. It's automatically generated. You can also manually generate migrations. Register project. Uh, project app. Now we're going to define this. We're going to get this into the um, Wagtail UI. The convention. We should put it in a Wagtail hooks file. I'm just going to put it in an admin file, which is sort of a Django convention to have an admin.py. And really, we're using, I think we're going to be using Wagtail for the admin. I don't know. Maybe I'll just follow exactly. But let's go back up here. Do this one thing at a time. So we need to register the Wagtail contra model admin. Uh, make sure it's in our installed apps. Okay. So it is not. So we have a model, we've defined that. We need to um, specify the panels. Now the panels are a way of telling Wagtail what fields to render a form, an ad administrative form for, so it'll automatically create that form. And we'll have to import the field panel from edit handlers, Wagtail admin edit handlers. There's above the methods. And we have a title and description fields. And Wagtail will look at the field types 
and render an appropriate rig widget. We actually might want to use a rich text field here for the description. I don't know. Average text field. Let's just add field panels. We'll, we'll migrate it to a uh, rich text field now. Alright. We'll migrate that. Now we need a way to edit the data. Just do all the conventions. Copy pasty. To that comment, this is a gotcha. You notice it here. If you have a single item tuple, you need that trailing comma. Now for defining these admin, um, I'd rather maybe a decorator would be nice there. But uh, for these admin interfaces, you don't need any migration. It's not actually changing the database. It's just telling Wagtail at runtime uh, it's to hook in. It's uh, why they call it a hook at runtime. Wagtail discover this file and we need to be running the server. And here we go. It didn't work.
It might be that I get created a new file on the disk. In, um, no, I already did this. Sometimes it doesn't pick up a new file, but I already... Hmm, all right, what's going on here? Why is this not working? A models project, right? It's not too many errors there. We got project admin. Link into our project. And mini order should be like right here. You can inject CSS and JS. A lot. Of, it's really customizable. It's pretty dang nice uh, content management system. All right, let's continue reading the docs. But at this point, we don't have any errors. This should be creating a new top level menu item in Wagtail sidebar. Weird stuff like this that gets kind of frustrating. Just to see if it appears in the settings menu. This has to do with the fact that I'm running 2.9. If this is maybe changed. I don't think something that substantial would have changed though. Yeah, Webtail, Contrib, Model Admin Options, Model Admin, Model Admin. That hasn't changed. We can go to definition, so it's definitely finding that. Same here. Everything is imported correctly. Let me just check my settings. That's the other thing. Is uh, if this, if I didn't do this correct, let me read this really closely. Wagtail. Contrib model admin needs to be in our installed apps. Installed apps. It should be part of the Wagtail core. Let me just close this stuff up here. Old apps. It might be that I have to 
included after some of these. Wagtail core, perhaps it has to be included after Wagtail core. Hmm. Could be that I'm using the wrong panel, and there's some underlying error that is not being logged out. Uh, I think I understand what's going on here. So, for example, this image chooser panel was specified here. I might need to specify a rich text uh, panel in my model. So, I've got a rich text field, but then the edit panel has to correspond with that. So. I think it's ah panel panel. Hmm. Now this is the kind of stuff that's really just kind of saps the fun out of coding. It's just stuff that seems like it should be working. There's no, I can't see any obvious typos. Not getting any meaningful errors. What if I run this in a debugger? See if there's something that comes up that way. I mean, I know I copied and pasted stuff, but I pretty much have checked all these imports, my model admins there. It's not middleware, it's apps. What's that?
One day I'll quit fighting these double quotes things. So it looks like this. And the name of this file is not of consequence. But I did follow that convention. Oh, I didn't follow the convention. I have a typo there. It is in. Oh. Okay. Change the file on disk, so I might need to stop the debug server. Restart it here. Mm, okay, well, that's it. <laughs> so it was a stupid error. <laughs> a file name error. It doesn't seem like that should. Uh, okay, I mean, I, that's the problem. It's. I don't think that really Wagtail should care about the file name, though. I'm not sure when that was introduced. I've all, I guess I've always just followed that convention. So many. It should really just matter that I'm registering it, but maybe at runtime the hooks have to be in this file. Okay, <laughs> got it. Let's add one. Tampera example project. Oh uh, yes, so this is another thing. We don't want all these things. We don't want embedded media probably. Hmm. Images. And document uploads, we don't want those until we know we want those. These embeds might be okay though. Hmm. Let's commit these changes. What did I do here? Got it. All right, now how do we customize the rich text field?
There we go. That's a little cleaner. Now the other aspect of a project, so there's two, the geographic scope or extent, and then um, the kind of sustainability or quality of li living, livability parameters, like how far from grocery stores they want the average, average resident to be, or not average, but necessarily most residents should be within some distance of a grocery store. Those kind of things. They'd be defined at a, uh, relating to a project, but maybe not necessarily in the project data model. projects are hierarchical, that hierarchy can, can be expressed in the Wagtail's tree model or through ge geographical containment or both. Right now projects can have sub-projects. There's no constraint you can have. Uh, in the Wagtail page hierarchy, we can start with our, our top level page. We can have child pages. I don't have any constraints on what can go under what. You can basically just go in and start putting data sources and books and home pages. And our pattern library is not registered for some reason. Patterns. So we need to get that registered. I guess it is. We need a home page. All right, so that's the problem. This default home page that Wagtail creates sort of is its own little island. We need to create a home page as part of the root, and then we can create patterns. Now we can add a child page of the welcome page. There we go. Urban Design Pattern Index. All right. Books and data sources should only be under resources, so I need to fix that real quick while I'm here and while it's fresh on my mind. Platform, resources, models. Subpage types allow you to define what content can come underneath something, and then you have parent page type. It goes both ways. In order to exclude these from the root, I need to add the parent page. Right, <laughs> up here. 
Yes. So these books and data sources really only should be, again, defined in the resources. What other kind of resources do we have? Design patterns their own kind of library. Yep, so now that we've uh, defined those constraints back in the root page, if I refresh this, there's no other page types now. Only the home page type can exist in the root. In order to define, in order to define a resource, I have to add the resources index page, and that's just like a folder to hold the resources. And you can actually kind of scaffold this content in a management script. And now I can add books and data sources under resources. But if I'm back to the home page, which is the welcome the title of welcome, uh, the only other thing I can do is add uh, urban design pattern index. And from there, I can add urban design patterns and tags. Hmm. For now, the, yeah, they'll be their own tags. Let's just make a view to render out some data. We're at one hour. I was thinking about going for two hours tonight. I'll get to a good commit point and we'll, we'll go out on a limb and we'll try to get this Geo Django installed. I have some problems with that, uh, with some operating system dependencies it needs for the GeoData abstraction library. I don't want myself or other people to have to deal with that difficulty. So two options, three options are one, don't it, don't use it, don't use J Geo Django. Two, try to install the operating system dependency and document how other people can do that on their local machines in various operating systems, Mac and Linux primarily. Or three, um, kind of create a do another Docker file for this project and install the dependencies in the Docker container. The reason I'm hesitant to do that is I, I don't know what the developer experience will be like having to run management commands inside of the Docker container or if there's a way to really smooth that over. Is it worth the trade-off of not having to install the geodata abstraction library? You know, we're already using Docker for the database. Is it, yeah, I don't know. So I'm not really certain how I'll go about it. I'll try it plan B right now. So since all we've done here. And here we do. irrelevant to the pull request, but just cleaning up as I go along. Cool. So this is a good stopping point, potentially. Push the changes up to GitHub. I'll open a pull request. So there, that means things are safe in the cloud. <laughs> and if you want to check out the code changes. Oh, 
now or in posterity, you can check it out here because the um, I believe the pull request changes should be there even when we delete the branch. I might be wrong there. I'll come to think of it. Let me just double check. One of these ones that we've closed and deleted the branch. So here's when we've closed it, and I and I deleted the branch. But you can see the file changed. Yeah, so you get the the history of it. The reason this is, I think, ho hopefully useful is you can see what's going on during the video, and also, you know, if there's a feature in this project that you, you just want to see the code for that, uh, you can either check out the project and look at the code for that, or look at the changes. I don't know. I'm just hoping this code is useful in general. So here we go. Let's check out the Geo Django installation instructions, and I'm almost tempted to. Do, I'm do this in a different branch. I'm going to do a couple of things. I want to update the dependencies. And now, pip is coming up with a new constraint solver, so this is going to be cool. Pip twenty twenty one. So it's going to make it easier to inst uh, upgrade all your dependencies to com compatible versions. Now I have local database migrations that have been applied. If I switch to new branch off of master, uh, I'll have to kind of <laughs> wrestle with the database being out of sync. Let me just see what kind of troubles I have adding the Geo Django in, Django in this pull request. I'm going to finish this pot of tea. We wouldn't have the spatial capabilities installed yet, but maybe that's maybe I'm wrong. So just for reference, Postgres doesn't automatically have PostGIS enabled. It's something you have to enable on a database by database basis. Your Docker Compose file. There it goes. Must have typed it wrong. All right. So yeah, our Docker Compose comes with the database enabled and SPG admin enabled out of the box. You just have to set up the initial connection. All right. So then we've created, it comes with the default Postgres database that's part of the Docker file. 
we created a SUDS database and OpenStreetMap database. This is documented in our README right now. We enabled PostGIS extension on OpenStreetMap, but the SUDS database doesn't have that enabled. So if we want to use PostGIS on, on that, we would enable it. I don't know why I feel such uncertainty about whether or not to include a spatial component in the pa uh, projects. Um, it P2? That's kind of interesting. Anyway, that's the one that uh, there's other Wagtail icons we can look at later. What I think is, let's keep it simple. Let's go with that, and uh, uh, by title. So we don't want to filter by title. That's what we're just concerned about. Uh, you basically have a table of the, all of them, and each of the titles. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. I don't know why the demo. Uh, the, I don't know why the uh, example has that. When you inspect a file, when you jump to a file, it opens a folder hierarchy all the way to that file. So that's kind of annoying. So let's go to our Wagtail hooks. Or projects, and what we need to do in any case is create a, a front end for that. So we don't want that list filter here. Yeah, it's fine here. I'll I'll, I'll sleep on the the spatial thing, <laughs> the spatial questions. So if I if I want to view this, one of the things that's nice about Wagtail page models is it automatically creates routes and everything for you. Since we just created our own model, we have to wire up a view and uh, render a template. So we'll do that manually. This is just standard Django stuff, but. Uh, Because what we want to have is two sides of this coin. I'm just thinking of this aloud. Uh, we want to have a way for admi you know, like admin users or signed in users to create projects and manage them, edit them. I could create a button here that would let you jump over to the um, sort of the project design tool. Then this field, this list would need to filter down projects eventually to only those that the user can edit. Mm. So I'm thinking a lot of this con this might be moved to the front end. Yeah, I don't have a lot of concrete designs at this point. It's pretty um, ad hoc.
Hey, what's up, Rich? How are you doing? So we don't have any um, other meta fields either because we just opted for a regular Django model. So it doesn't assume anything. It doesn't add created dates or anything like that. I don't know that those would be as relevant. So anyway, I think our, our list view would be relatively simple. I'm doing pretty good, making some progress on this um, project. I can actually, I'm not sure you've, You've been watching the recap videos on YouTube. I can show you the, the demo of the client, though. This is pretty cool. I was excited about it. It's small, but significant uh, way of illustrating the one of the goals of this project. Let me hop over there. We've got a standalone JavaScript front end that's going to be the way people interact with this, um, these projects. The thing I'm defining now is a way of people to collaborate on uh, projects of g different scale, urban design projects. It can be a city, um, uh, a neighborhood, a country. And essentially when you define the, the geographic scope of the project, you can then start working on it through our design and analysis um, framework. So here's an example of a project for the city of Tampere. Uh, it's done quite, there's some weird gotchas with the data, but uh, there we go. It's showing um, points of interest. These are grocery stores, supermarkets. And for a hypothetical example, <coughs> say an urban planner wants to say, make sure, uh, you know, 80% of residents are within one kilometer or two kilometers of a, a grocery store, and they just want to get an intuitive sense of that. Uh, you can just change the, the distance on end units and say, yeah, that's our parameter, and then save that, and it'll get persisted to the project. And for each of these layers, like health, safety, education, transportation, we'll have similar metrics that are defined, and a really good example is this uh, Turku open platform. And I've, I've contacted the developer here. I'm really hoping to get some kind of feedback as to how they went about this. I, I have some uh, suspicions that they were using GeoTrellis behind the scenes and some kind of a routing engine, but I, other than that, and uh, Mapbox, <laughs> which I just pivoted away from. Um, but yeah, this is a very similar thing. Um, it has a little bit more lag behind, uh, because behind the scenes it's doing, rather than just a simple buffer operation which can be done in a JavaScript client, it's actually doing a street network analysis and seeing how far people could walk in 800 meters via the street network. And then finding the amenities and such that are within that range uh, and doing and calculating some, uh, I would say, livability metrics. And these livability metrics have, have definitions. So this is a really good example of kind of what we're wanting to do as well, uh, this Turku is, I think I said this is a city in Finland. <coughs> and yeah, so very similar. Um, we have to figure out what the metrics are that people want to see, but I know an important one in Finland is that people have access to healthcare within like certain large radius, like rural, particularly rural people have access to healthcare clinics. Uh, on this scale, you'd be looking at stuff like playgrounds and parks, open space, uh, fire and police coverage, you know, safety. So yeah, it's coming together, basically have the you know, working points and then figuring out how to uh, make a business model that would support the development of the project. And projects seem like a natural way of um, allowing this Product, the project to be fully open source, there's no conflict of interest there, but uh, um, one of the perennial issues with any open source project, and I was uh, talking to my uh, 
friend Victor today about like you know really good projects like uh, Inkscape or or the GIMP, uh, awkwardly named but still good nonetheless. Um, is that of funding and keeping the initiative? Yeah, and basically open source projects have very difficult time reaching the level of quality that even basic freeware does. I don't understand what holds it back aside from sometimes being spread so thin, uh, the developer resources. You know, there are some examples of really good open source projects that are either crowdsourced or just like done of uh, having a large enough community around them. You know, QGIS is also a really nice project and it has a lot of initiative behind it, but um, probably could deal with some usability improvements. I don't know. I don't want to be harshing on it, but in any case, I think open source needs to figure out a, a way of uh, financing the movement. And I don't have the answer, but we're going to try to uh, finance this project and keep it open and hopefully have a positive effect, net benefit on like the OpenStreetMap data and stuff like that. So yeah, that said, that's that's our goal. Interactive, choose your own adventure, create a project. You know, the context in Tampere is different than like India or someplace like that. You know, they might have, you know, the population density is much different or they, and they, their, their political goals might be, uh, priorities might be different. Like um, I was reading India has a, an imperative, I guess, that every uh, resident be within something like two kilometers of a polling station so that every resident has access to vote to participate and that's in also becoming important in the United States so again different places have different uh, priorities and different definitions of what is important and this project shouldn't really assume we don't want to be a, just a general purpose GIS application then we would be competing with QGIS or Esri or something like that we want to have um, be generic enough that people can, specific enough that people, it's already in a natural language when people are thinking about urban environments, intuitive enough that it's similar to a video game um, where you can just basically start, you just see it and you can start t tweaking stuff and, and figuring out how it works right off the bat. But generic enough that you, that the user's not kind of pinned down to you know our definition of these metrics. So I think this project's a really good example, but all of the metrics are predefined and they're not parameterized. If we could figure out how to generate this data in a parameterized manner, I think we would be really in good shape. But nonetheless, this is really cool. So yeah, that's what we've done today is just add this idea of a project, which will have probably a geographic scope. And now we're going to uh, go through this class-based view and just create a, a front-end display for the projects. Yeah, thanks. It's really starting to come together, I mean, it's been a very vague idea, just totally inspired by, you know, like city skylines, honestly. Uh, but then wanting to, so for a while I was kicking around the idea of, well, maybe I can make my own city building game. And I look at all these old, oh, these other open source city building game projects and they all just peter out. Uh, even some of that have really cool prospects, like city bound and stuff like that. Just they like turn into a one developer show and then the yeah, developer abandons it or, uh, in city game, city building games, and city simulations, so it's a complex thing, you know. If in things like three D uh, animation software, or nonlinear video, nonlinear video editing, or graphics design and photo manipulation, those are all really complex, complicated softwares. So you have to have a community around it, and not just a single developer, and not fraction, faction, and frac fragment uh, the developer, the, f the scarce developer resources. Uh, so this is a complicated project too, and I'm not sure how to sustain it. I want to get some people involved, hopefully. So we just want not a template view, but a list view. So from, I don't, I'm not sure we need that render, from uh, where do we import these views? Django views generic. 
what's new with you, Rich? Are you doing any st stuff on the over her over the horizon? Is it wireless? Just wireless in general. I'm not sure if it's Wi-Fi. List view should be fine for now, but we will want to render particular entity view. I'm totally guessing now. Let's get the list view first. Good enough. I think for a, a list view, all you need is that. Um, and we're just going to use the regular get request, and it should give us a query set object back. We can iterate over those. You can rename the query set. Uh, view. Alright, so then we need to define a URL pattern. I'll define the URLs in here. Black core networking. What's that? Never heard of that. That's good. Now we're going to import these. Ooh. Actually, the, I'm getting here for a second. I think this is good. How do you do a object list? All right, cool. Uh, I'm going to keep the URL comp. Kind of modular, so we we'll look over here. URLs and import Okay. Hmm, interesting naming. Is red because it's bad to have unencrypt plain text on encrypted? All right, so we got our projects, and then at the root, it'll render the project list, and we'll create a template extending our base HTML. Come on, Jimmy. Hazard, yeah, makes sense. So it's color coded. Uh, templates. Now 
Now I didn't specify which template to use. How does it know? I think it's going to use the the um, class name. This I want to do. And how do I just specify the template explicitly? Template name equals project.html. Let's see if it works. So essentially, yeah, that makes sense. Now if we go to the front end project, and it's Yes, so I'll, I need to change the URL. Yaw. And then fix the other error. <laughs> One moment. Hmm, yeah, yeah. So this needs a file path. Or I can, in any case, I have to prefix it. To, with the app name, it's a convention I'm following. There we go, publishers. Okay, yeah, and I copy and pasted all this. So let's fix the pro copy and paste problem. Yeah, good. Good stuff. And I don't want to assume too many features here because the mind starts to go many different directions. But you know, you could imagine people would want private projects and things like that, like GitHub as public and private. And granted, there's nothing new under the sun, so to speak. There's uh, pretty common patterns uh, that we could follow with existing collaborative communities. But I want to do so in, a, in as lean of a manner as possible, driven by actual demands, and get, keep this prototype really small so we can get some, some feedback. And the key is these common patterns will leverage people's intuition, familiarity. But in any case, I'm not going to add private project right now. There's no need for that. Well, what I do need to add is a link to the project page. So we need to be able to render each project. And each project will probably need um, a UUID, I think. And by default, our database is using just these uh, primary key. Yeah, it's just auto incrementing. Which wouldn't be a bad thing with um, if every project is public, but when you start to get to private projects, then you don't want people guessing the URL. So I almost think a UUID field could be good here. Uh, but again, it's not required. I do need a way to get to a project and that would be something in the path and typically you would use an identifier like uh, the numeric identifier identity in the database or a uh, slug yeah what do you think rich if you're if you got an opinion uh, i'm leaning towards the just uh keep it simple you use the uh the id which is going to be unique project one project two and then figure out if uuid is needed later 
And basically, once you get to each project page, you'll get some be details, uh, just a brief description of it, of it, and then be able to hop over to this. And that'll be what I'll be working on probably in the next live coding st st session. I'm not going to be able to get to that today, but where you'll hop over and all your parameters will be somehow stored and you'll hop over to the editing view and recall those parameters and uh, be able to tweak them and save them. And once we've got that, those mo moving parts where you can define a project, and you can tweak some parameters, some choice parameters. We're not going to get to all of these yet, but um, figure out maybe at least one other. Recall those parameters. Then the next will be to probably a uh, follow-up step soon would be to run some server-side pr uh, processes to like identify the building footprints that are within those, calculate the percentage of buildings within the defined project scope uh, that meet that criteria, stuff like that. Well, we've already got working code for that as well. Yeah, thanks, Bridge, for uh, affirming that choice. Yeah, keep it simple for now. And that's the kind of lean approach. But you know, it's all, it's good to get a sanity check too, because there could be you know, good reasons to go with a little bit more complicated thing up front. So yeah, we need to look at our URLs conf. Um, which, Also, cool URLs don't change, so we will want to settle on a, <laughs> a URL scheme kind of soon to not introduce backwards incompatible changes once this gets to production. But right now, we are just a prototype. So our catch-all view needs to be there. Now, I could probably use regex to specify that this is only the base view. With path, I don't think we're using a regex. Where are we? We need a generic view for that. Built in action. Not the same.
rich text. All right, Rich. What kind of uh, rich text features do you have? Do you do you allow bold and italics, underline, hyperlinks? And we'll need a link to that. Let's just do. I know it's one. Ooh, it's not running. Uh, how? Ah. Copy paste code. Uh. Yeah, this is PK. of ID project, project. very cool oh dang it that's another problem this is an open feature request the wagtail has a little widget down here that lets you edit things. I figure out how people will edit their project. Hmm. Well, for now, it's Wagtail, but This is not a wagtail model, so the little wagtail icon doesn't appear. I opened a feature request for that. So I got a Stack Overflow answer. It's kind of complicated code. I, um, I wonder if this got merged into the Wagtail core. Looks like it's been closed. Enhancement. This might be in Wagtail three. What are we at? I can't remember.
Well, damn. The thing is, I think it's in the base HTML. Back to the user bar. We'll have to think about how people edit these. And if I add editing on the front end, that means we'll probably want to add a lot of people to add them to the front end form as well. <sighs> Which is kind of making it wagtail less and less useful. Or a little bit in this case, it's less useful. Let's see when this was merged and see what release it's in. Yeah, it's in 2.10, okay. So that's, an, that's a good reason to update. Uh, let's give it a try. I think without any changes, we've got the Wagtail user bar here in our base template. So without any changes to our project template, <coughs> it should inherit inherit that. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> it goes to Wagtail admin. You know, I didn't do is run migrations. Mm. Boom, here we go. Ooh. This is cool. I just like Wagtail. I want to keep it around. It's so 
elegant and maybe if we can get this to be the primary user interface for people it's, and you can really configure it so I mean hypothetically we could have a project list here that's only the projects that a given user can manage nice then if we um, I'm just thinking if I want to add another feature request uh, when we're at this project and we open this menu if we if I could edit click the edit this page that's because that, that's the consistent behavior um, otherwise I have to jump to the wagtail admin then navigate to projects then edit which is not too bad it's a couple of clicks though I can see this would be a more complicated feature request. But in any case, I uh, was just coming over here to say, well, if I wanted to use some rich text, view live doesn't work. right now it's good as it is let's make the link so what do we do Jeez. Come it all. Add all? How do we add it all? I'm getting tired, I gotta There we go. Link to edit. That's two hours. Good stopping point. I'm going to go for a walk. Enjoy the night air. Cool. Yeah, because this was overkill. I didn't want to implement that. It was a good answer, though. I gave them the upvote. And it, but it ended up getting uh, put into Wagtail Core. I, that's one of the things I really appreciate about Wagtail is uh, not all of my requests have been embraced by any means, but uh, I've either been gently it's been gently declined or redirected or um, sometimes even taken up and implemented so yeah it's I mean overall it's been a good experience I haven't had any really uh, forceful like no or this is a stupid idea type of responses and they've gotten really great support on Stack Overflow and on GitHub when appropriate but I learned early not to of course make support requests on GitHub when they prefer to use Stack Overflow and I can respect that so here we go. We've got our wagtail up to date. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I have to freeze my pip. Right, so that's one thing I wish kind of pip would automatically keep a lock file. Like uh, like poetry. Constraint solver will be nice though. It's coming in. I think the next version of PIP will have it. There's a bunch of stuff here. Aw oh, man, how did my.
my environment got corrupted, not corrupted, but mixed in with the um, the poetry project. So yeah, we need to actually re revert these changes. Hey, what's up, Max? Good to see you. <laughs> I gotta fix this though. I this is gonna be a mess. So what am I gonna do? Reverted it. We're gonna remove the environment. We're gonna create the environment. Oh yeah, I got executive deactivate. Oh no, I've screwed it all up. Made some good progress though, Max, on this on this project. It's coming along. I got several big parts uh, converging. I don't know if you've been keeping up on the YouTube. Uh, I've been trying to keep the videos pretty brief on YouTube, but they're still running like 10 to 15 minutes. The <laughs> explainer videos. This one I'll try to keep brief, but we've already even today got several changes. Um, we have the big pieces are coming together. We've got a JavaScript client that lets you interact on a map and and change some. Uh, Parameters and see the see the changes right away when you move the slider. You see these growing areas. Um, for like example, you want to be within one kilometer of a grocery store. All the all the buffers around the grocery stores will grow and converge. Uh, we've got database. We're using PostGIS now. I've got the project partially Dockerized. Uh, move, uh, we're able to move data from OpenStreetMap into the PostGIS database. Like a lot of big. Parts are coming together. We're starting to make more sense to the point where we could start demoing it. That's the idea to get feedback. Okay, that'd be cool, Max. Uh, yeah, there's a few updates. I was wondering if we could move the development docs out of the README into their own thing. And uh, remember, we decided to use the. Uh, What's the name of that uh, documentation builder we're using? MakeDocs or whatever, MKDocs? If we could move the stuff out of the README that's development related, like setting up the environment, activating the database, that kind of stuff, uh, that would be easier for people to, when they're reading the README to get an idea of what their project is, and we'll have a link to the documentation. And we need, then we'll figure out how to build it and push it to GitHub pages, but one thing at a time. All right, so we've got a bunch of these things, I hope that's not bad. Bad business. I think there's actually an issue for this, Max, if you want to do documentation related to tasks. Yeah, um, this is not exactly it. So I'll just update the task. Um, if you want to self-assign this one, this would be a good one. Oh yeah, sorry. The um, essentially this issue 124. Just take the developer stuff out of the README, move it into MK Docs, which you've already done partially. You I remember migrated this MK Docs stuff here, so move it into here. You know you can create a new. Markdown file like uh, development or something like development.md. 
and then that will make our readme easier to manage. That's probably good. All right, so cool. Thanks, Max. It's awesome. That makes it easier for people to get involved with the project. And uh, you know, anything we can do to smooth over the the, um, the initial curve of getting a development environment set up and getting oriented, uh, hopefully, we'll eventually have you know more people who are interested in in rolling up their sleeves and checking out um, an issue, making a contribution uh, without impediment. Because I know that's a uh, other projects I've worked with, um, that's one of the biggest things is just people not being able to get even a development environment started. It's challenging. So I'm, I'm hoping the only de like development dependency will be basically Docker. Anything complicated, any complicated dependency will be Dockerized. So you can run a Docker Compose, but that's a different story. All right, so we've installed these dependencies. We restored our, our requirements text, but wait, have we? Was Jupyter Lab already in this project? Maybe that's the problem. This is really weird. Closer at this requirements text. I do want to discard the changes. Because Jupyter Lab should not be a dependency of our main project. Yes, we do not have, we do not have Jupyter Lab. We only have dependencies of Django and Wagtail. More or less. Wagtail now can write to CSV and XLSX. Pretty cool. I'm tempted to switch this project over to Poetry, but again, I don't want to keep the dependencies, the developer dependencies, minimal. I'm hoping just having this new virtual environment will, will shake the handle a little bit, get things working, and not get Jupyter Lab in our, included in our dependencies. So let's see what happens. This could have been cached somehow. Yeah, the old environment could have been cached. I don't know what was going on there. Oh, yeah, Max, by the way, uh, we're meeting tomorrow, 4 p.m. 
Western or Pacific time. So if you want to join John and I, we'll be doing a little bit of hanging out, maybe some pair programming. I'll do a more in-depth uh, tutorial of the changes. John has got the um, most recent code checked out. He's running the migration script. We've got a couple of uh, notebooks here to handle um, getting OpenStreetMap data into PostGIS and doing a basic proximity analysis, which I essentially was able to replicate from QGIS into Python. And then we can use this Python code in the Django project as a follow-up. So we're kind of thinking a couple of steps ahead there. But uh, again, these things are converging and getting kind of real now. All right, so we've installed our um, project dependencies. Everything is good there. We're going to upgrade uh, Wagtail again, but this time without having all the Jupyter Lab stuff that kind of somehow bled in through the work with the notebooks. All right, cool. And if you can't come, that's okay. Uh, you know, it's not. Of course, it's not required or anything like that. So. Um, and if you, there's a better time that works for you, you know, we can do a one-on-one -on -one session uh, pair programming thing uh, at your convenience. So we do want Wagtail 2.10 as part of this work today. Oh, up, is it update or upgrade? And I got to get out of the house a little bit. I haven't gotten much fresh air today. Ah, what is going on? Am I typing po poetry? Uh, yes. I should just be using poetry, I think. My subconscious is telling me so. See if I need to. Uh, so part of the problem with dependencies is some of them need to be built, but uh, I might not have build essential, and other people would face that challenge as well. And now we can freeze, and hopefully everything will be okay. Yeah, and we already have, <coughs> this is cool, we already have Django REST framework, so I can actually start working with a, I think that was a dependency of uh, Wagtail even, I'm not sure, but I don't remember installing it. I can, I do have a, an endpoint, a view that's serving up just plain JSON, and I manually had to serialize that, and it, uh, I think Django REST framework might have made that a little bit easier, I don't know. So let's just upgrade Wagtail. Etc. and had a couple of other couple of other things. Very cool. So yeah, Max, if you're in the process of doing the um, working with the code uh, documentation, I mean. Uh, if you're interested in just kind of running uh, through the steps in the developer docs to see, just to sanity check them to make sure uh, that they make sense, that the that I'm not missing any uh, key details. And depending on your bandwidth, if you even want to try um, work with some of that OpenStreetMap data and getting the importer to work sometime in the next couple of weeks, that would be helpful just to get uh, feedback on the documentation and the process that's involved there, but I'm not sure if I've really included all the necessary context, like where do you get the OpenStreetMap shape files? I just don't remember off the top of my head. All right. So basically, uh, I think I should call it a night though. I'm getting pretty tired. Let's take a look at this. Oh, there's one more thing I want to do. Just one more thing. The URL. So I hope we can use the reverse. Can't remember how to do this. Okay, cool. There's Max.
All right, I don't so much need the reverse, it looks like. I can, uh, if I use a named view, so platform views, but you named it in the URL, right? But there's a new, there's a more like cleaner way of doing this, I think. So we put it, it's part of our model. And again, this is something that Wagtail just gives you for free, but okay. Oh, and they're putting inside the view function, uh, the actual method here. That's kind of strange. Ah, oh, come on. Shouldn't be. Oh, dang it. Whoa. Let's see. Board return reverse the mod the uh, view and the args. PK. This is a PK.
let's give it a try. Now we're gonna use this thing. to try. See that? It's sourcing the Suds notebooks. That's how our, our namespace got polluted. Oh yeah, it's been All right, let's see if the what error message I get. Yeah, I knew it. I was gonna do something. Oh, it's plural, so I was gonna do a typo. Projects. And project views. Project views. That's. Okay, hey Max, it was good seeing you, and I hope to see you again tomorrow. Have a good evening. And thanks again for our helping uh, out with the documentation. That's super important. Uh, this needs to be a dictionary, not a list. Okay. It's a dictionary. It's just got a little string. Then the view. I'm wondering if I could just pass in the view as a reference. Hold this answer, by the way. Things haven't don't change super often in Django land. name in there yeah so I need my URLs again project view let's give it a try yeah learning everything as I go I don't know much about anything so 
That's just the way. Yes. It is. But thankfully, thankfully things are well documented. We have Stack Overflow. I hope that gen future generations of programmers can have the resources good or better than Stack Overflow. As good as or better than. And the Django docs. I want to and the Wagtail docs. Good. We did it. That's it. That's it. Uh, I think it's as much as I can do tonight. I'm just getting tired. Tired, tired, tired. Cool. So let's go ahead and get our changes up on the screen. And just we'll spin through them in the summary section of this video, which is coming up soon. Two hours, 15 minutes. More requests. Essentially, I'm just going to read the GitHub diff and um, top to bottom, but starting, well, it's kind of awkward to read it like that. It's not too bad, I'll just go with it. See how it turns out. Excellent. All right, so I'm gonna do the quick outro video right now. Hello, and welcome to the recap of today's CodeBuddies.org live code hangout. We've been working on the Sustainable Urban Design app today. We are coming back into Django and Wagtail, we're defining a new model, uh, Django model, and adding that to the user interface. The purpose of this model is so that people can collaborate on urban design projects. They can say, you know, we're working in this city or this district or this country, and um, here's the purpose of our, our project. That's as far as we're getting today, but uh, the idea will be that then they can share resources and views of the geographic scope of that project through our user, our JavaScript user interface where they can define parameters such as uh, we would like every resident to be within two kilometers of a grocery store, or something like that, and see how many of the households in the project extent meet that criteria and track that over metric over time. That's kind of the generic um, general purpose or general idea behind the uh, the project. Today's changes are, are very minimal, uh, just defining the model and uh, a way to edit uh, and add those projects. So we'll look at, to actually, let's look at how it works in the um, UI. As an aside, I do want to give a shout out to this Turku open platform. Uh, it's really exemplary. Um, it's in the same vision uh, really, as th uh, this sustainable urban design project, you essentially can dis decide how far people should be from um, amenities, uh, various types, whether they're commercial, retail outlets, or you know, food and health, other necessary activities, schools, groceries, walking. Um, you just decide how far they should be, and then you can actually just kind of query around 
the area and it behind the scenes is doing like a street network analysis to see how uh, using the street network uh, how far you can travel uh, 400 400 meters and you know how many what are this the scores across each category for that this is a super cool project uh, it's also got some really nice um, kind of heat maps where they've pre-computed some I would say livability metrics that we're really interested in as well in this project like mobility how easily people can get around to key things uh, so this is a very powerful analytical tool it lets you kind of define the extent of your analysis and the, and the desired uh, qualities uh, what we're aiming for with this our project is a little bit more granular control over the um, parameters like how you define walkability and, and how far you should be from uh, you know mobility things like bus stops or grocery stores you know we've showcased that in a previous summary video so I don't want to get too far off track I want to just show what we built today this is summarizing today's hangout um, but giving the general picture of why we're building the project in there and inspiration we're taking so a project is really just uh, right now two fields a title and a rich text description that can include um, links I've uh, excluded most of the other rich text uh, field options like embedded media as I don't want to get too complicated right off the bat but uh, you know, headers, bold and italic text, and line breaks might be useful as well as linking, uh, for example, to the City of Tampere website. For example, there you go. Now we will save that. This is a Django model, so it, it's not really following the Wagtail um, model flow of uh, publishing or drafting and things like that. I opted for the Django model to keep it simple. Uh, so we have to also updated, uh, today updated Wagtail to the latest version, uh, is it 2.10 I think it is, something like that, which gives us a nice uh, feature that I actually requested. Uh, and it, um, it's really nice that uh, you know the Wagtail community are so active and receptive to ideas and willing to take them up even though I didn't really myself have the uh, skills or inclination to do it, they saw value in the idea and um, implemented it. So let's go ahead and take a look at the front end. Essentially what we've got on the Wagtail admin the, um, is the list of projects and the, you can edit them and search for them. On the front end we allow users to discover projects by going to this projects page. It simply lists the um, title right now but we could for example, add the description here, but you can click on the project and you see the rich text and title text rendered properly. So again, this is not a oh, sweeping change, not really an advanced or elaborate feature, but it's a key concept in our uh, project, um, and allowing hopefully to fil you know, facilitate collaboration, um, multidisciplinary collaboration, because you have people working at different levels and different layers of the urban tapestry, transport networks, um, utilities, zoning, health, welfare, education, safety, all of those uh, are specializations and they come together to form a common uh, project typically, uh, but aren't inherently required for any given project, at least by our definition. So here's the feature I actually requested that regular old Django model pages uh, that um, didn't used to have the wagtail icon down here because this icon only kind of made sense for, for wagtail pages because there's a few other links like edit this page uh, but it was inconsistent and it was a little bit confusing uh, what, you know, to the end user who's not maybe familiar with wagtail why is the wagtail menu only appearing on some pages there was a technical reason for that um, but I think in some levels our job as software developers is to kind of uh, get beyond technical limitations and solve usability problems and s focus on user needs and Wagtail has uh, really gone to great extent I think in general uh, to make a very very user friendly um, content management system so uh, I can't <laughs> uh, compliment the Wagtail project enough it's been really nice to work with from a developer experience and the user experience so let's take a look at the code we defined a, a regular Django model with a title and description field. This description field is actually using one of the Wagtail 
uh, fields. It's called a rich text field. It basically stores the, um, the text as HTML in the database. Uh, do we have a post? And um, sanitizes it so that only certain tags can pass through. So let's just take a look here. We Now with our project, if you're in the Docker Compose Up, you'll get um, a Postgres database instance as well as um, PG Admin. So we can view and edit some data and interact with the database uh, visually. It's pretty cool. So yeah, I've only created one project. It gets a primary key, which is an auto-incrementing integer. Title field, which is var 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 variable character field. And then the text description, which is rich text, allowing certain HTML tags to pass through that are defined here. And the paragraph is, I think, a default one. Then we're going to register this with the Wagtail admin so that you can create uh, projects in the back end. So we just need to tell Wagtail when it builds the form, which it automatically does for us, how to render the fields. And it'll automatically detect the uh, data type and render the appropriate field. And this one, we tell it to render a rich text field. And then it'll check out the uh, widget list here, the feature list, and render only those buttons. Pretty cool. Uh, being a, it's a Django model, we have to define the string representation, the default string. And we wanted to be able to get a link to this to specific project. So we just defined the git app salute URL and returned a reverse path to a view, which we'll look at in a minute, and passing in an argument. Registering things models with the Wagtail admin is pretty straightforward and well documented. You create a class that inherits from the model admin. You tell it what model you're working with. You can create a, uh, select a menu icon. There's a, I think about one, about a dozen or so um, icons that Wagtail comes with. You can install more through like Font Awesome, Wagtail Font Awesome, or things like that. I just kind of kept it with the default for now. You can give things a weight so you can control the order in the menu. Uh, Wagtail Admin has a settings menu, so you can have nested. Not only can you have nested menus, which we, we, like reports, but you can create custom settings. Well, we might come to that in another, another uh, for another feature, we might create a custom setting. I can't think of the, what it is off the top of my head, but I've been sort of reflecting on this project a lot. Uh, and the Explorer is actually this top menu where you can kind of drill down and explore the Wagtail page hierarchy. Wagtail page uh, model uh, is like a tree. And um, Django model it's just flat database tables. Um, so these wouldn't necessarily, these projects wouldn't necessarily, as far as I understand, come into the Explorer anyway, but so I just left the, the default false. When you render the list of projects, it's a table more or less. Uh, and you can just uh, s select w or specify which fields to render as table columns, as well as which fields should be searched. So if we had multiple projects here, I could narrow it down by searching. And other attributes, if it, you could just search and filter, it's pretty cool. Uh, we just don't have any of those things to demo to showcase right now. And then you just register it with um, Wagtail. One gotcha is that you have to name it Wagtail underscore hooks. Uh, I had a typo in the, the file name and for like five minutes or so, I was like, what is going on? Why isn't it appearing in the menu? I was getting frustrated. Um, but yeah, I had, uh, it's just I had to rename the file. Uh, I kind of think that's a little bit of a bad design. Uh, for example, if I wanted to name this admin or something, uh, I know which kind of collides with the Django convention. But um, anyway, I guess uh, you know it is a thing in Django that you have uh, files that are named specific specific uh, to their function, like your models or your model file, and that allows the framework to discover them. So anyway, yeah, be careful. Make sure there's no typos in your names. Uh, so yeah, we didn't do anything with admin pi. We created a view that two views, and we're just using regular Django class-based views. So this is why we're using a modern uh, and mature uh, and long-standing uh, uh, web development framework. So we just get some really mature features out of the box. And um, it handles the, the, the main path, the critical path of, uh, that so many people have already trod. And we just define our own specific logic. So with a list view, you just tell it you review name you inherit from list view. Tell it what model you're working with. Uh, 
the context object is what you get in the template when you're um, interacting with the data. So to make it a little bit more uh, developer friendly, we'll give it a, a name, a meaningful name. Otherwise, it's called a like context object or something like that. And we're just being explicit um, to specify our template name. And the default pattern for templates is um, in something that's derived from the class name. I don't remember exactly how the pattern works, but this way I can just have uh, our own way of organizing things and it's it's not ambiguous. Same thing here with project view. So we have a list page that lists all the projects. And in a, um, a single, a detail view that lists a single project. And basically, in order for those uh, to be accessible, we need to give them URLs. So for our default namespace here, we're in the project URLs. Uh, so we're, everything is going to be namespaced here based on our global URL configuration, which is here. We just import the project URLs and namespace it to project slash. And then our top level route just renders the, the list view here as a view. And then when you click on a link, it adds the primary key as a URL parameter there and renders that project view. It passes in the argument. We'll give it a name here so that we can use that name in our model reverse function project view. The get absolute URL returns a URL to get to a particular model instance. This reverse function takes a view name as the first argument and any keyword arguments. You can also pass them as an, um, an array, an ordered list of arguments, but the explicit is better than implicit, so we'll just use keywords here. And our templates are relatively simple. For the projects list, we have just a you know, static header. This really should be an H1. And I gave our context object a name, if you recall. the. Uh, Context object in the project list view is projects, and in, in the product project view is project. So it makes sense. We can iterate over those, display a list item, and then make a link to each one, getting the absolute URL for the hypertext reference, and display the title as the link text. When you click on one of those links, you're taken to the view, and it renders a template. Project title, I use the correct header level here. We render the project description as a rich text field. Uh, through the rich text field filter, that means it's going to sanitize the output, only allowing the rich text um, tags. I think general the general set of those. The input field uh, probably filters. This is my guess. It sanitizes the tags that are not specified in the input widget. And this renders it, instead of escaping it, or instead of rendering it as just raw HTML. So if I take this off and I refresh. You see we just get the HTML. But when I put that back on there, it'll render it. So yeah, that's it in a nutshell. Um, the idea is here, people, whether or not they're signed up, can kind of visit the site and get an idea of what projects are being uh, developed and discussed. And you, you know maybe even search geographic areas or areas of other interest uh, through keyword tags. There may be public or private projects. All of that's up in the air right now. We just got the basic feature in place. And before kind of settling in on any specifics about whether or not we'll have public and private things or geographic querying, we want to kind of tie back in the JavaScript interface to this idea of a project. So that'll probably be what we'll work on maybe tomorrow or over the next week or so. Yeah, all right. So if you want to check out these specific changes, uh, sustainable uh, github.com sustainable urban design slash app and we're this is pull request number 129 so even if this has been merged you can still see the specific changes that we've made not only today but potentially other changes uh, in the future before um, you know finalizing this work this pull request here if you'd like to get involved we have a lot of issues uh, we're open to suggestions. There's a lot of ways to contribute to the project. You don't have to be a coder. If you just want to test stuff out or 
help us with the documentation. This is all of our developer documentation. We're going to move over to the developer docs section, but you can see we're following the um, all contributors specifications. So you can uh, help us with design or outreach or community building or documentation. Uh, there's a lot of ways that we would we would welcome new contributors. So this has been a Code Buddies live code hangout. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved with uh, like-minded uh, coders in general, stop by CodeBuddies.org. It's a really uh, open and active community. CodeBuddies.org platform is also open source. You can go to GitHub.com slash CodeBuddies. All right, well, thanks for your time. Have a great day and stay well.